So talking, talking Dow, right? Market's moving sideways. It has been from about the 20th, excuse me, from about the, uh, from the 7th, uh, basically up until now, we've been moving sideways from the support of 23,000 with a resistance of 24.5. So I've sp spoken in depthly about support and resistances and why typically support and resistances, if there isn't enough news, if there, like with all the news that we've had between you know, record driverless numbers, you know, some of the worst retail numbers, um, you know, so many people out of work, you know, they always have numerous uh, discussions about, you know, many of these jumps will not come back. And, you know, the market is kind of, people are like, why is the market up, you know, a thousand, you know, 700 this day or that day, but we're sitting in the same, you know, we're, we're sitting in the same channel. The market will be down uh, back into the 23 and then it will race, you know, right back up to 23. And they're like, why is the market up? The market is ripping. What's going on? Meanwhile, the market is moving sideways. And it has been, you can see the chart, right? Just looking at it from here, you can see that the market is just literally moving sideways, not going anywhere. <clears throat> right from about the 7th, April 7th to for a little over a month, the market's been moving sideways. And the reason being is because you can see right here that we're, we're butting up against an area of resistance, right? Where the market kind of peter panned and then kind of subsequently rallied back up to that 27K mark. Again, 27K is another hard, uh, resistance area so if the market were to break out of 24.5 and we were to see it with with a nice volume then our next area of resistance would be 27k right on a dow so if the market breaks out like if we were to break out of this channel if they say we've got you know better vaccine or we got a vaccine or we've got uh you know better medication <clears throat> for managing patients we'll see the market move up again this has nothing to do with uh the number of jobless it's, it's just literally it's just liquidity right there is uh i was watching a video i think yesterday where they were talking about you know that the market is literally that you know the s p 500 is literally removed from the economy like whatever goes on in the economy is irrelevant the only thing that matters to the market is liquidity right and so with the fut with the fed dumping trillions of dollars into treasuries and mortgage back loans and you know saying that they're going to buy junk bonds etc uh, buying we're buying they're buying etfs so the value of stocks now and etfs and bonds etc now has a raised floor right so instead of zero <laughs> being your floor being your floor right stocks will go to zero the government and the fed said that we will print enough money to maintain enough liquidity in the market. So now we have a false floor, right? So that unfortunately robbed, you know, a lot of Americans, not just of their tax money, because of course, all of this is done via taxation. They just literally printing this money and then pooling money from taxes. This is money that will never, that will never get repaid. And the other thing is that it robbed many small investors who were waiting for an opportunity to kind of, you know, thinking that the market was going to kind of have like this U-shaped recovery in terms of the market um, and give them you know ample opportunity over the course of a year to be able to add liquidity to um, to a portfolio right and then maybe get some nice gains unfortunately we saw a much more of a v-shaped uh, a little bit more of a v-shaped recovery especially from the lows of uh, we were down about down to 18k and then you know the snapback um, of just about 5,000 points anyways with that said um so that so that's where we're seeing like none of the none of the information in terms of like new cases spikes in cases areas opening up and then seeing a spike in cases the market just doesn't care in terms of where it's going to sit right the market is going to sit currently at twenty three thousand, and then it will hold um, the resistance area of 24.5 and then 24.5 was an important area looking back um looking back at the chart here we can see 24.5 right here, right? So the market dipped down to about that same area. So this is a known area of support within the market. You can see it right here. Subsequent re-rally, I talked about 27K um, extensively where the market held below 27K and then finally broke out of 27K. Um, and then you can see that right here where the market double topped that 27 and then subsequently sold off. So that's what I see. That's basically where we're at in terms of is the market going side? Is the market going up? Is the market going down? No, the market is going sideways unless we see a breakout on volume 
that's the only thing that matters. We're knowing that more buyers right, are stepping in. There's more liquidity, more buyers are stepping in. If more buyers step in than sellers, then the market goes up, right? Increasing volume on increasing price. The price, you know, um, the price has to go up. The stock has to go up. If we see an increase in volume and a decrease in price, right, then the stock has to go down because we're seeing enough volume and the price is going down and no buyers are stepping in and the volume keeps going up. Well, then the only thing that can happen is the market will fall. So it kind of does, really doesn't matter at this point um, what sort of news comes out. And so that's something that's for those who are like M1 investors. Um, looking at my portfolio, I'm still slightly down, we're down about five and a half, six percent, I think, from my holdings. Uh, let's go holding. So we're still down at six point nine percent, and most of that is in CCL. Was way too early to the party um, for CCL. And we're still adding funds to the. Uh, still, of course, adding. We are right on track, right? Or, like I said, originally I wanted to put in that, you know, my goal was 1K a month. And, of course, for five months, <clears throat> five or so months into the year, and we're already ahead. We'll probably probably end up hitting about 16K. You know, maybe if I put a little bit more, maybe I'll hit <clears throat> 20K for the year. Uh, so, but I think I'm looking at <clears throat> a healthy amount of about 16K um, that'll go into this portfolio. And then, of course, I still have my Roth with um, M1. Then I put in, I gotta add a little, which I already have a little bit of money coming in. I'm gonna add a little bit more for the month, but we're still um, a little bit behind. I've gotta add a little bit more. But talking about my dividend portfolio, uh, I do have a little bit of money uh, coming into the portfolio, and it's just, I just added, I think, 50 bucks or 75 bucks to my dividend because I'm slightly behind. I'm 0.4% uh, undervalued and I'm overvalued in my risk. So I, I didn't add anything to my portfolio here, even though I am down, don't want to add a little bit more just yet uh, because the market is trading sideways. So I'd rather wait and see if the market is going to pop out of 24K, 24.5, then I'll put the remaining money that I have. If not, I'll wait for the market to kind of backpedal back down to maybe a comfortable level of 23.5 and then add more, um, to my portfolio. And I'm just gonna let that sit right here in my cash balance because of the market moving sideways, um, because also because a lot of the earnings are coming out, right? So we have all these mixed good, bad earnings from different companies and the market is still trading sideways. So once all of that information is kind of out, we may see the market maybe pull back and retest 23. And so that's basically where we're at now. We're at a support of 23 and a resistance of 24.5. If the markets were subsequently to break 23K, uh, our next area of support would be, I believe, 21K right down here. And then we'd fall right back down to about 18K, um, which would be like your lowest, your, your lowest support. If the market were to break out, like I said before, we're looking at 27K, which is why if the market were to break out on volume, I would put poor money into my account because I don't want to miss out on that bit of a rally <clears throat> from where we're sitting now, that would probably be about 8%, um, about an 8% rally in the market. I would not want to miss that. So I'd probably take a lot of that money that's sitting in my, in my bonds and maybe throw that in and then subsequently add that money back. Uh, maybe at a later date when the market was viewed from my perspective as being uh, a little overvalued. Uh, with that said, in terms of, like I said before, I'm going to be holding a bit more cash. So since I usually do add about at least a thousand a month to the portfolio, I'm going to keep more of that money in cash. I'm not going to put it into bonds. I am uh, adding a little bit more to my bond fund because you can see I am undervalued. I'm adding a little here, just kind of bring it in line. But for the most part, I'm going to be keeping most of that money in cash and not auto invested. Um, and then it's just, and it's just because the market is moving sideways. I could choose to add that money in and then potentially miss out on a breakout, or the market could subsequently come down. I, so and then all that money that I've been adding as the market is moving sideways will then be devalued and lose value because the market will go down. So either way, it's a risk, right? It's a risk going in, you miss out on the upside, and it's a risk going in because then you end up losing money or you know temporarily losing value. Um, by adding in at what might be considered a high from where we're at right now, right? So it kind of is what it is. It kind of is what it is. 
other thing I did want to talk about was um, we're seeing, starting to see a little bit of accumulation of dividends, which of course is why I made this account. So originally when I, when I first started, you know, when you're looking at a small account, right? If you're starting with just a couple of hundred bucks um, and looking at what your small dividend would be like, for example, December, um, I don't think I can go any further yet. December was where I first started earning dividends and I earned, what are we looking at? Since I say 10, 25, 35, maybe let's just say 50 cents, right? I made 50 cents in dividends for the month of December. And then for January, I earned uh, 36, that's 70, like say 70 cents, 80 cents. I earned, we'll just say a dollar, right? A little over a dollar, yeah, about a dollar, right? For the month of January. And then once February rolled around, we see we got 60, 60 cents, that's 90 cents. Um, let's just say $2, right? We'll just say round it to two. So we've made about 270, right? So we're starting to see that the the dividends will start to accumulate as you start to keep on continually adding funds to your account. You'll see that the overall amount of money that you get in terms of dividends will increase steadily. Same thing for the month of March. Looking at March, you can see it was a dollar here. Dollar thirty, one fifty, two dollars. Let's just say three dollars, right? Four dollars. That was back when CCL was still paying a dividend, which is why I bought it. Um, so that's about four dollars. So we're saying five. So let's say seven dollars. Actually, no, still maybe more like eight, maybe eight or nine dollars. Uh, oh, I actually, got more here for the month of March. So maybe even ten, right? Maybe even ten bucks for the month for the month of March. And then just kind of like fast forward. To where we are now in May, we're looking at the completion of April. We'll see April here. We're at three, eight, uh, nine, nine fifty. That's about eleven dollars. So maybe about twelve dollars for the month of April. So we're starting to see a little bit of scaling, right? And then of course in here in May we're at what is it, about six, seven, eight, um, eight, thirteen, fourteen. Uh, 15 were about maybe 15 16 dollars right so from going all the way back um, looking at the the portfolio when it just started and you're literally making like under a dollar in terms of dividends for um, for that particular month we're seeing you know month after month that where the the dividends are kind of starting to accumulate and of course as we're adding more to the portfolio right as the portfolio value goes up so do the amount that you earn in dividends and that's very similar to with with my roth my Roth also um, earn, earning earning dividends as well. You know, looking back at the activity, that's basically most of my cash, my flow of income, my, my monthly income would be, of course, from dividends. And that's the purpose of, you know, just basically adding money to this account, trying to maintain your principal, right? Because principal, principal is, import, is important. I know some people have said that they don't care. This number will fluctuate, of course. But you do want to make sure that you're not just throwing away all of your principal for the sake of a dividend. That just doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, if you're if the if the stock value, for example, like looking at um, I don't know, pick any any dividend. Just look at CCL, right? Or just look at Ford, right? Ford's a good example, right? Um, Ford no longer <clears throat> no longer pays a dividend, right? So you had a stock that had been paying a dividend for years, and then looking at it on the daily. All right, you can see that this is not the trend <clears throat> that you want to see in your stock, right? It doesn't matter if you bought uh, your stock down here and then it, yeah, it pays, you know, you know, 15, five cents or whatever the dividend was. Um, and you're like, oh, this is fantastic. I'm earning, I'm earning money, you know, every month, et cetera. But then you're losing, you're losing your principal, right? You're losing the original money that you put in. And so if you were buying for, you know, up here, uh, you lost, you know, huge portion of of your, your, your basically your, your original balance with the money that you put in just for the sake of a dividend. Yes, you will see um, flows in terms of, you know, price, price fluctuation, but it's very important. Like I said, I said this a while ago about tea, that people who were buying tea in the 40s were making a mistake because if you look back at tea on the weekly chart, you'll see that tea for the most part had a hard time breaking above 40. So $40 in AT&T completely overvalued. $28 for AT&T, completely valuable, a lot of value there, especially for the dividend 
that it pays. And so it's important to understand you might like the company. The company might show good numbers. This company might have a good moat, right? You, you, you foresee the company being around for a long time, but you've got to pay attention to the past. It's very important to see where stocks have been um, and what the market, what the, what the market's view over the long term, literally over the course of almost 20 years, the market says we don't view AT&T as a hard value stock above $40, right? That's important. History is important. You know what they say about those who don't pay attention to history? They're doomed to repeat it. And so if you were a buyer at $40, right? If you were these people over here who were buying AT&T at $40, well, then you subsequently experienced the same uh, the same pattern that happened to those who bought here. Yes, this was the event of 2008, but we see it again right here, right? In 2017 and 18, where the market was soaring and AT&T was subsequently pulling back hard, pulling back from $40 to $30, subsequently coming back up to $40 and again, right back down. So for those who like AT&T, should have been a buyer here, uh, especially down here at 28. I think it came all the way down to 26. No reason not to buy AT&T, similar to things like Pfizer, Pfizer or another company uh, pulling back for back base almost to its 2013 support levels. It was an obvious, it was an obvious buy um, with any event. So it's, it's always important. You might like a company, company might be able to put, put out good numbers, might have a solid uh, dividend, but you want to see where is the, where is the, the stock price at? Is it at an area where it's overvalued or is it at an area where it's a bargain, right? Maybe you're a fan of avocados and avocados are two for five at the supermarket. Two for five, I really don't like avocados that much. Maybe they go on sale and now they're four for five. Um, and maybe that's a bargain for you. You might step in and be a buyer at that price. But at two for five, I like avocados. I don't like them that much. Same thing with the stock, right? I like Pfizer, really good stock, really good company. They they post good, they typically post good numbers, they come out of a good dividend. Pfizer up here at 44, not really a buy a buyer. Pfizer at 29, I'm all in. So it's important to understand that, especially when you when you're a small investor um, and you're not working with you know hundreds of thousands or, or millions of dollars that many of these individuals are that can keep huge amounts you know of money on the side while still being heavily invested with a large amount of money. You know, for a small investor who's maybe putting in uh, you know five hundred, a thousand dollars into the market, you want to make sure that that money is being put to work properly. That you're buying things that are a value so that you're not wasting that extra cash because maybe you don't have another pool to draw from, right? Maybe you're an employee um, and you could choose to go out there and maybe get a second job to increase the amount of money. But for most people, I think most people who don't even save as most Americans, I think they said don't even have enough for $400 case of emergency. Most people aren't saving. So if you're a young person, I would say that learn to live well below your means or let's say learn early on in life to live well below your means and to always, always be putting you know, money away for a rainy day. This is not my only account. I have other accounts that I have long-term and, and accounts that I trade. But in terms of uh, just kind of show, showing from a small uh, investor's perspective, how to add money to, how to add money to an account, what's the purpose, paying attention to support and resistance to support and resistance and then looking back and seeing what's the the research that's out there paying attention to your to your holdings so that you might think well this stock is having some bad news um is that news really bad and damaging to the company over the long term or is it a short term blip in the company that the company will eventually you know shake off right in any event thanks for watching I'll do probably do another one of these um, in about two weeks, or if some, or if we see the market break above um, 24K. Like I said, looking over the, the short run, you can see that the market was holding below like around 24K, around 24K with another hard stop right here at that 2019 levels. So this is typically what I look for. And like I said, right, that 27K, you should be able to see that right there. Boom, 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 right? Multiple times with the market held below 27K. So a breakout above 24.5, will cause the market to rally the 27K. It's just the way it is. Thanks for watching. Take care. God bless.